uh, I'm a bit embarrassed that I never thought anyone would see my wall. You thought no one was ever going to see your posters. I have to apologise for the fact that I am coming to you from a wardrobe today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Fantastic. Actually, I'm actually in the Caribbean and I've had to switch off the air con so it's not noisy. So I'm Why are you in the Caribbean? Have I, interrupted your, have I interrupted your holiday? No, no, no. Okay, so Jack, let's dive in. Yes. I have, I have sheets of questions here. I have that lovely crinkly sound of like paper in the okay. background. Are you, you're I've clutching my, your I've Miller. Got my, I've, got my, I've got my Arthur Miller. Yeah. <laughs> Tell the listener what the speech is that you've picked. I think it's business is definitely business. I think is probably what you would call the speech from Death of a Salesman uh, by Arthur Miller. Classic. And I was so pleased when you did this because... No one's picked an Arthur Miller yet. And oh. of course, he is, well, certainly Death of a Salesman is one of those plays that is sort of almost universally considered one of the best plays ever written. Why do people believe this is such an exceptional play? I can say why I think it's an exceptional that's, play. That's a good idea. Let's start there. Uh, I think it's an exceptional play because I think it's a study of masculinity mm. and capitalism there's nothing quite like it i think the relationship between particularly the three men mm. is um devastating and that idea of the importance of presenting a front of needing a lie of creating a version of yourself which makes you uh, happier with who you truly are mm. uh, is such a dangerous thing. And, you know, I'd say it is probably a bit more masculine than it is feminine in terms mm. of that energy to mm. lie about yourself. Mm. But the way that he does that the way that he gets inside those three as they um destroy themselves mm. is quite remarkable and it's... i don't think anyone's written about it as well before or since i may have read it at school but i don't think so i think mm. i read it at university my play uh you'll see is full of uh, uh, uh annotations uh, lots... yeah but also <laughs> crossing out sections of the play like i re-edited the play for arthur miller because <laughs> uh that's you were like uh, you don't need what... this bit <laughs> absolutely that's what um it was very interesting um revisiting the marginalia um uh but you yeah. know that's what um being young and and <laughs> stupid gets you that you think you can do it better but uh I, I did it with three sisters too uh i i did it quite a lot at that age i think i think it was my way of trying to understand the plays mm. was just to try and rewrite them a little bit i read a really interesting thing once about saying it's more important to be a capitalist than a pioneer because in this speech he talks about his brother doesn't he and his dad mm. and them sort of being part of the gold rush and again, I think as a society, we're sort of coming back to that idea that to be an adventurer is the yeah. higher, you know, power, is the higher being. Um, but that was so a point where to be an adventurer was, was not as good as just staying in, um, um, staying in your state and selling and selling and selling and just making as much money as possible. And it's interesting in relation to Linda, who, you know, who's his wife, Willie's, Willie's wife, mm. being the one that stops him going to Alaska in that up to that point and that's very near the end of the play that you get that reveal right. up to that point you always assume that she's the one that sort of sees clearly and <laughs> sort of sees you know that has escaped the sort of disease that has that has taken Biff and Happy and and um and Willie mm. and then and then she basically says you know you've got a great job here why risk it mm. and and by 
encouraging him to stay here. And Willie is so easily manipulated all the way through the play. He's so easily manipulated, but by encouraging him to stay here, you know, that's, that's the, that's also part of the death. When you think about studying stuff at school or at university, you know, we're so quick to look at writing and say the writer clearly intended here to blah, yeah. blah, 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 blah. And I mean, maybe you can speak to this, obviously, as an incredible writer yourself, you know, to what extent do, do you find people attach intention to you that, you know, you're like, that was just fluke. That was just a thought coming out of my head. Yeah, I think that's a lot. Of, I, I mean, yes. Uh I don't want to speak on behalf of my kind, but yes, <laughs> there, there is a lot of that. There is an awful lot of that. I left theatre arts A-level mm. um, after a class in which we spent the entire ep uh, lesson. I almost called it episode. <laughs> <laughs> um, we spent the entire lesson discussing the significance of a blue kite in in My Mother Said I Never Should. And... Oh. Um, and I, I just said, I don't believe the writer would have thought that long about the colour blue. And yeah. we spent an hour talking about the colour blue. And it was just one of those lessons where you just kind of go, no one's really thinking here. Everyone's just sort of saying things, yes. you know, and uh, and it just it just it was just my irritation with the subject went then. A very good friend of mine is the writer Laura Wade. Mm, and amazing writer. I love her work. And yeah. uh, and I think she's an extraordinary writer but also she is so intentional um right. and so I think I'm much more scruffy around the sides in terms of writing and and when I feel like I'm writing well is when it's sort of spilling out without much thought yeah uh with Laura I've seen her construct and I've seen multiple drafts of her plays mm. and the way that she hones and the way that she, I, I think that probably and I know this wasn't true of my mother said I never should because it was a play that was to some degree found in the rehearsal room you know that, that there was right. a lot of there was a there was a real collaborative process behind it all right but with with Laura you probably could she probably does think about mm. what color the kite should be for an hour um <laughs> uh uh so there are writers for whom that could be true of, but um, it's not true of me. And I don't know whether it's true of Miller. So are all the, the sort of Millers that we know, like All My Sons and, you know, The Crucible and View From A Bridge, are they all, they were all early? This is place, stuff. this is place one, right? So this is place right. one, Arthur Miller, Death of a Salesman, The Crucible, All My Sons, uh, Memory of Two Mondays, which is an earlier version of A View From The Bridge and A View From The Bridge. Um, <laughs> Like, all right, so yeah, like, like all the ones that are really famous were in that all the first ones batch. that are really famous. God, he's so in churning that, them out, like churning in that out eight classics. Year, in that eight year period, he wrote four plays that I think, uh, you know, certainly are, 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 are four of the most significant plays of the last, um, you know, 100 years. Did something happen to him in terms of that you think stopped well, the he became, writing? He became incredibly famous. Uh, which I think, you know, um, yeah. married Marilyn Monroe. And, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, you know, and all that yeah. stuff. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But just, and also, you know, you have your moment when suddenly everything comes out right and then you have another moment when it doesn't. Yeah. You know, that's the tragedy of writing, that you just kind of sit there and go, I was much better yesterday. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and but it's you today. Think, yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, that that's... That's mm. what it feels like. You know, we get, I, I think I get one good day's writing in 14. Do you write, I guess for you, I feel like a lot of the time you're writing for a certain theatre, right? The theatre knows that it's a new play by you that they're having. And so do you write, no? <laughs> you're like, no, certainly not. So there's no sense, I guess I'm saying, of, of going, I know this is a play going into an intimate space or going into a huge, going in, like Harry Potter going into the, palace or whichever one oh, it there is, is yeah. there is a sense of that but there isn't you know it doesn't affect what you write no and often you write something for one space and then they don't want it, it. <laughs> and then you're trying to sell it to another space so uh yeah you know there's not a really uh because i find when yeah. i read plays it strikes me straight away what kind of a theater it should be in i hear you um it's so, so i started off at the bush and I think I wrote all my early plays 
with that space in mind yeah I don't think I was ever quite able to leave that space alone because I loved it so much yeah and now I think I've probably got a similar relationship with the old Vic there's something about that space that I just I think that's the theatre that I imagine in my head when I write yeah I think a tiny bit 